Good afternoon, everyone. Learn at lunchtime will be every Friday at 1215. This weekly free program fe features a variety of different Pennsylvania topics. Uh, to sign up for our webinar, remember to visit our website. Today's discussion is going to be Dr. Walter Mashaka and how do reptiles and amphibians survive during winter in Pennsylvania. Next week, uh, next Friday, will be uh, Brad Smith, and he is going to be a Spirit Republic whiskey distilling in Pennsylvania. But uh, the, our next Adventure Lab, Adventures in Nature Lab, which is today's program, will be March 12th, a month from now, and it will be Songbirds of Pennsylvania. But there are many more programs scheduled. So remember to check this landing page that is on your screen. It's also in the chat box. And you'll see a full listing of the next few weeks topics and we update them regularly. I am Sherry Trimble, museum educator at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. And now I would like to turn it over to our museum director, Beth Hager. Thank you, Sherry. Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today for our new virtual Learn at Lunchtime series. We started Learn at Lunchtime programs in our galleries on summer Fridays back in 2012 to offer the opportunity to meet and interact with our curators, educators, volunteers, and other experts in the community. Now, since we continue to be closed due to the pandemic, we'll be connecting with you weekly via Zoom in 2021. Each Friday, our staff will bring you Pennsylvania stories and treasures featuring a variety of special guests and colleagues. I'd like to welcome you to join us for as many as you can because there's something for everyone. We'll really look forward to reopening the museum's doors later this year, welcoming you back and offering Learn at Lunchtime in person. But in the meantime, grab your sandwich and enjoy virtually and be ready to ask questions. I'm pleased to introduce State Museum Nature Educator Beth Erickson and Senior Curator of Zoology and Botany, Dr. Walter Mashaka, to bring you the first Adventures in Nature Lab program. Beth will be bringing you nature and science topics every second Friday of the month. So thank you, Beth and Walter, and thank you to all of our staff for creating this special series. Over to you guys. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've already heard our guest today is Dr. Walter Mashaka, and not only is he a senior curator, but he is a herpetologist whose research centers primarily around the ecology of North American amphibians and reptiles. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Beth, and uh, thank you to the uh, to the entire education staff and to. Uh, our museum director, Beth Hager, and to you all for spending your, your lunch with us. <clears throat> so Dr. Mashaka, it's currently winter in Pennsylvania, and just last week we had a huge snowstorm. Even when the temperature drops and is below freezing and the ground is covered with ice and snow, we still see animals in our yard searching for food, but these animals are usually birds and mammals. We don't see reptiles and amphibians. So let's talk about where those animals are and how they adapt to, to survive in the winter. How about we start with frogs? How do frogs adapt to cope with the deep snow or a layer of ice over the surface of a pond? Well, Pennsylvania is home to 17 species of frogs and toads. And as you were mentioning, winter can be a difficult time for species, particularly those that have dispersed northward in recent times. One such species is the green frog. I think we have a picture of that. That's a very common frog uh, in Pennsylvania, and it even extends its way up into southern Canada. So it must be doing something right. But what does it do in order to uh, overwinter? Well, this frog, as you probably have seen around uh, shorelines of lakes and ponds, canals, and the like, <laughs> come wintertime, they cannot tolerate being frozen. So what they do is using environmental cues to know that it's time to uh, go under for the winter. Into the water they go, below the ice line, you know, and into the mud to cover themselves. And then their breathing goes very, very slowly, maybe five beats per minute. 
they're breathing cutaneously through the oxygenated water and there they stay, essentially in suspended animation until the spring warmer water gives them the cues to get back up and out and active again for the year. That is the typical approach or response to being able to get through the, the cold winter. However, other frogs, more northerly type frogs, such as the wood frog, I think we can go to that one. This frog is really quite interesting. It ranges from Alaska continuously down through Pennsylvania and in, sort of into uh, Virginia, and then a few isolated spots farther south. This is a true northern frog. It breeds, uh, at least in our area of south central Pennsylvania, and around mid March in vernal pools. Vernal pools might make for another interesting adventure in nature lab for some time. But for the time being, the, the poor frogs got to make it through winter. How do they do it? This is really quite amazing. What they do is, is it gets cold, ice begins to form, ice crystals form on the outside of their organs, between their muscle and their skin, and on the outside of their cells. At the very same time, their liver produces glucose, sugar, which makes its way into cells, and it connects, it binds with whatever molecules, water molecules are in there. What does this mean? It means that you have a sugary slurry that does two things. Number one, it keeps the cells inside from freezing. And number two, it allows the water to be there so that it doesn't dehydrate. So what does this frog look like in the winter underneath the uh, duff and the leaf litter in the forest floor where they typically live? You have a solid rock of a frog is what you have. Its heart isn't beating. It's not breathing but it's still alive. And then comes spring, it quickly thaws out and hops away to the breeding pond. That's pretty fascinating. It's called a cryoprotectorant. We would call it antifreeze, like in your car. So these are two very different ways of withstanding cold temperatures. One, by a southern frog that made its way north and lives near water, so uses, its, uses the water as a warm bed. And two, this northern frog, a boreal frog, that really lives in the woods. It's not going into the water to sleep, but it can handle it by protecting itself with its own natural made antifreeze. That's amazing. And that explains why we don't typically see them during the winter season, because they have their own ways of adapting. So that's a little bit about frogs. How about snakes? Now, People often find snakes in their yards and sometimes in their houses, and not usually because they want them there. And most of us don't wanna snuggle up with a snake during the winter to help them stay warm. So how are our snakes in Pennsylvania able to survive without coming into our houses? Well, um, there are 22 species of snakes native to Pennsylvania. One of them is the garter snake. This is a very common snake, much in the way the green frog is a very common frog. Even if you know very, very little bit about, about the amphibians and reptiles of Pennsylvania, you would probably recognize these species. That was actually a picture of those uh, the pile of snakes or garters. I think we have a picture of a garter somewhere here. In any event, that's, that's me holding a garter and a milk snake. Actually, you get a two for one on this. What these snakes do is they're small. They really don't get very big. So to get out of harm's way, cold's way, they sort of do in a way what green frogs do, except the bed that they get under is not water. It's generally mammal burrows that are underneath the frost line or root holes that have rotted out. They can fit in there. Garter snakes from the work I've done really have very small home ranges, maybe an acre or two, and they may move 200 uh, meters in a, in a line but they're really homebodies. So it helps them a great deal to be able to have a place to go often right below them for the winter. So consequently in the spring, when I've come to uh, check my traps, cover boards and the likes to see these snakes, they're often very muddy and getting ready to shed because they had just come up out of their winter torpor. That's what the garter snake would do. And they must be doing something right because they're all over the place. And you have small home ranges and you eat earthworms and maybe you get big enough to eat 
small mammals, then it, it becomes critical that you have local uh, refuges that you can fit into. Our next snake is the smooth green snake. This is a very, very different kind of a snake. This is a very northern snake that's actually evolving towards live birth. They hold on to their eggs for the very longest time because they can't find a very warm place to lay them. And then eventually they lay them and then maybe a week, sometimes only a few days later, the eggs hatch. Nobody knows too much about their ecology, but the few people that have found them in the winter have found them piled in numbers of over a hundred snakes in abandoned ant mounds. So what this is telling us is that these are that the, the place for them to spend the winter is very limited. So they get to know the place and they can find it and they'll repeatedly go there. Now just keep that in mind as a matter of scale that, that they're finding like a hotel essentially, a place that's safe for all of them to pile into as opposed to garter snakes that are found here and yonder in a pasture or grassland or open woods in mammal burrows and root holes. Beth, what do you say we move on to the next snake? So rattlesnakes are an interesting one. I, I'm not a fan of the snake in general, but definitely not the rattlesnake. I think they were they're, they have a design for a reason that says, stay away from me. So these are ones we really don't want to be around in winter, but I know they're important to the ecology and to food chains in our area. So what do they do to survive? Well, if we remember, and I hope it's easy because it was just a minute ago, that the smooth <laughs> green snakes will sort of pig pile into an ant mound. Well, the farther north you go with a timber rattlesnake, and timbers go all the way down to Georgia, where the winters aren't the same kind of winters they are in Pennsylvania and even southern New York where they occur. The farther north you go, the harder it is for them to find, because they're a big snake, they can't really use mammal burrows and the like. They need a place that they can all be safe in. And for that, they typically pick south and southwest facing cliff faces, which are very sunny in the winter. The snakes themselves tend towards darker colors in order to absorb heat. The whole biology of living around these hibernacula is amazing. But up here, what they do is just like the smooth green snake that has these favorite ant mounds that are abandoned that they go to, Generation upon generation, even longer for rattlesnakes, the farther north you go, the more tied they are to these gigantic snake dens. That's what they do. Now, when you go farther south, let's say into Georgia, Alabama, where it's really not the same kind of cold, what, what these snakes will do, same species, is they don't really need a place to, to hole up for six months or five months. Instead, what they do is individually or in very small groups, they might use a pine tree stump or maybe a, uh, an abandoned burrow of uh, an armadillo or, or some other mammal. And they're only in there probably no more than a month at a time and they'll come out some because it's a messier winter. But up here, they don't have that, up, that, that luxury. And so they become ever more tied to a communal hibernaculum for which they must know where it is because when they go off to wander, during the, the spring and summer and fall to mate and eat, et cetera, they have got to be able to find their way back. Otherwise they would freeze to death. So as you can see, there's a wide range of ways to respond to cold that do seem to be working. And as you can, you would also see the margin for error is very, very narrow. So not that we necessarily want to encourage them, but we do want to assist wildlife. Is there anything that we can do in our yards to create a space to help these cold-blooded animals during the winter and still keep them out of our houses or our garages? Well, I don't really know because a lot of older houses uh, have stone basements and cracks and things will go in there and use them. Very often they're things like ringneck snakes and garter snakes and milk snakes. And these are completely harmless animals. Um, I think I would just leave them alone that's, that's definitely a plan. Now, I do have a question that's a little off the cuff. The photo of you holding the two snakes, is there a story behind how you had two snakes in one hand? Yes. Um, 
I have a 20 year project of uh, marking and recapturing eight species of snakes at a field station that is owned by uh, Carnegie Museum. It's called Powder Mill. In fact, we feature its uh, founder, Dr. Graham Netting, up in Ecology Hall. So I have these areas, these spots where I can catch snakes. And there are times where I've picked up 21 at a grab. I actually have pictures of that, which is quite a thing. So those two there is nothing. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, two is more than enough for me, definitely. I'm going to remind our audience to put some questions in the Q&A box. We're going to be asking those with Dr. Mashaka in just a couple questions. So you mentioned um, the research that you're doing. What animals are you currently focusing on besides the snakes you mentioned? Well, um, we have a, a long-term project on uh, turtle nesting at the local county park of Wildwood right here in Harrisburg, Dauphin County. We have long-term research being conducted at Letterkenny Army Depot, the Department of Defense land near Chambersburg, and a few other kinds of projects here, here and there. But all of these, you know, when you think about the State Museum and we think about stewardship and caring for objects or caring for history, well, when you study plants and animals, that's our way of caring for, for our natural legacy, which is yours. So when we learn things, and you learn things, and then you can make better decisions about the world around you and how to take care of things. That's great. Um, a question from our audience, and it's a good one, because we're kind of talking right now about the cold winters we're having this year. But if we think back to 2019, it wasn't really a cold winter, it was kind of warmer. Do reptiles and amphibians behave the same way regardless of the temperature, or is temperature a factor in how they decide to spend the winter? Well, it's a little bit of both. Some species are so are cued so tightly to day length that the warmth won't get them out. Other things, such as painted turtles and even garter snakes, and believe it or not, um, box turtles will come out if it's unseasonably warm for a while. Now, for many of those animals, they can just go right back into where they uh, they overwinter, and so no harm is really done unless they're they're using up a lot of their resources just sitting out there. But for example, just last week, one of the students working at Letterkenny Army Depot came upon an old male box turtle dead out in the open. And this was following a warm spell we had. So it had come out, then been trapped, stuck because of their ectotherms and they need the warmth as their own fuel, and it died. So this becomes its own form of selection in light of climate change, because they're being exposed to conditions that they otherwise would not experience, and much more frequently, more erratically. So we're seeing climate change even with, with having an impact on a smaller level, but, but that can become a bigger problem. Absolutely. Uh, a question from our audience, specifically to rattlesnakes. What sort of cues do rattlesnakes use to relocate to their hibernacula? Mostly it's scent. Pheromones. That's, okay. So they leave a scent behind and then they follow their way back? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And youngsters that, that are born, that. <laughs> youngsters that are born at the hibernaculum learn it. I mean, they have other cues that they take in, but okay. then they're born there, they know their home. Some of them will disperse elsewhere and maybe cut, maybe start a life somewhere else. But others that are gonna stay there, then know where they have to come back because if they can't find home, they die. That makes sense. Uh, what's the best way, if somebody wants to start studying herpetology, what's the best way for them to get started? Well, it depends on your age, of course, but um, you can always volunteer. And uh, there are herpetologists that work for government, well, such as I, and others like USGS and the Park Service and state universities, private colleges and the like, and um, you can ask to volunteer. And depending on your age and experiences and such, you can do that. More professionally, you go to school, um, at, at least you get your four years for a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology and take herpetology and any other kind of ology you possibly can. The more you know, the more you learn, the more you know. <laughs> That's excellent, excellent. And I, I am a person who does recommend 
volunteering, I think that can give you a lot of experience. So I think that's I a do too. part. So we talked about the, the frogs and the snakes. We didn't really get to turtles, but we don't have a, we can, we can talk about them a little bit more another time. But my question with the frogs that you talked about and the snakes, when are we gonna start seeing them again? Is it gonna be specifically related to the changes in temperature? Is it a particular month? Do they come out for mating? What's their um, dynamic that gets them out of their um, for most winter of these, habit? It's going, for most of these, it's gonna be sustained temperature and precipitation. So okay. um, we have spring peepers that are starting to become winter peepers because it's getting warmer, but we'll start to see them. Mid-March, you'll start to hear that it sounds like ducks quacking or chuckling, and that's the wood frog. And they come out in big numbers around vernal pools, which are just fascinating systems. Um, green frogs will be out in April, but they really don't make much noise until early May and onward because they have to warm up and they have to eat. One of the quick differences I'll just add to this is that when a wood frog goes to sleep in the winter, if it's a female, she already has her eggs. American toads are the same. And so right when they come out, pickerel frogs too, they breed immediately because they've got their eggs. Frogs such as green frogs and bullfrogs go into winter sleep without eggs formed, but they have a lot of fat. And then they use the fat in the spring to turn them into eggs quick as they can. In June, July, and August, they lay their eggs. Let me just this add one more thing. Let me add go one ahead. more thing no, real quick ahead. if I have a second. Sure. Part of this, this trick about being a southern frog moving north is what do you do with tadpoles? Sometimes they don't, they don't always transform into little froglets by fall. So what they do is the farther north you go, the more apt they are to spend the winter under the ice. Until you get up to southern Canada where bullfrogs will spend two winters under the ice as opposed wow. to one winter under the ice here. And if you go all the way down to say Florida or Mississippi, they're, they come out pretty much that same year. So this kind of takes us back to climate change. So that idea that as our climate alters, animals are gonna to have to really change and adapt in order to stay in an area to survive. Northern animals will be having to behave more like Southern populations. Well, we have a question from our audience about what happens if you find a reptile, specifically their question was about a frog in winter. So they were on a walk out near Hawk Rock. They saw a frog at, who seemed frozen, didn't move a muscle. And is it something if you see that, if you find that, should you just leave them be? Or do is there something we need to do to help these animals? I advocate leaving things alone. Okay. Because you don't always know what the circumstances are. Uh, yes, and I've, I've heard that for other animals too. Let's see, another question is, how long can a green frog stay underwater without having to come to the surface? Are they ones that are, are, per, are completely aquatic or semi-aquatic? Well, they have lungs and they breathe like you and I do. Well, they're actually air sacs. But as the water gets colder, they can stay under the water longer and they, they breathe cutaneously through their skin. So it depends partly on the size of the frog in the temperature of the water. But the answer is that they can, yes. Ah. And you mentioned vernal ponds, and I just wanna tell our audience that we will be talking about those in a, a couple more sessions. Um, I find them interesting as well. I'm all about the frogs. I can leave the snakes far behind, although I recognize their importance to our ecosystem. So um, speaking of snakes again, one of our audience members had a question that I would totally understand. What's the best way to get a garter snake to leave your backyard? You would have to kill it. You can't just ask it to go? Doesn't seem to work out so well. Okay. But if I might just add, these are animals that eat earthworms and insects. And the bigger ones will eat small mammals. There was a paper that just came out that shows that skinks, we have one species here in Pennsylvania, they actually incidentally have an effect on holding back Lyme disease because of the ticks they eat. Wow. So there's sometimes there's an underlying benefit to the animal. And it, it might be that if that garter snake is there, then there's something in the yard that it's looking to eat. 
So well, it might be getting rid of a, a pest. Benefit is a relative measure. Okay. Uh, they are because they are. <laughs> and what we should be doing is being aware of nature around us and appreciating it and doing our best to take care of it because ultimately we're just borrowing it from the future. So to use a money example, the goal is to live off the interest, not the capital. And by doing these sorts of things like these talks and studies and having big collections to study from, that is just giving you all the more information you need to, to accomplish what I just said. Do you have a favorite reptile or amphibian that's your maybe one that you, you enjoy studying, especially if there's something unique about it? Well, it kind of varies among the groups, I guess. Um, it's kind of a tough one. I kind of like them all. Anything um, that we can add about salamanders or um, turtles in the winter? I know it's such a huge topic. It's really hard to cover all of this in just a few minutes. Well, how about so. this then? Let, how about we go with this one uh, then, Beth? Just as we're talking about wood frogs that will be uh, in another month coming out to breed, although coming to Alaska, it's in June because it's they're just chasing a temperature as you can imagine. So it's going to be mid uh, March here. Well, mid March here, that's starting to bring in Jefferson salamanders and spotted salamanders that will also be using. Uh, the vernal pools. Then later on in the season, spotted turtles that are all speckly, just like uh, spotted salamanders, will enter those vernal pools and start hunting things to eat in there. Spring peepers may use the pools. Sometimes toads will. Newts do. They're there uh, once the water comes back up. So winter isn't quite as long as as we might think it is for amphibians and reptiles, but definitely for some species, it is long. It's very long. So these long. animals are still out there in the winter. We may not see them, but they're doing what they need to do to adapt to survive. Well, they're if all we find them, them, we should leave them be and mm -hmm. just observe. But all of those species are also underground. Okay. okay. They're also sort of dormant. It's just that they're their activity season is a lot longer. It's very interesting, the animal kingdom, how you have some animals that need supplements to survive through the winter, animals that we see, and then other ones have these unique adaptations that allow them to um, overwinter on their own or in a group with other like species um, in order to make it through to another year. It so. sure is. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a question that was in the chat box and we didn't get a chance to answer it, please, or in the q and I apologize, please send it to um, the email that's given in the chat box and we will do our best to reply. Um, Dr. Mishakar, is there anything you wanna kind of wrap up and tell us about our topic today? Well, pretty much I just wanna say thank you for uh, showing up. I hope that you you uh, learned something and are, and more appreciative of the world around you, more aware of it. And um, I hope I'll get to see you all again for future programs that we do. We're a pretty good team over here and we get some interesting things accomplished for yes, you. Yes, we are. We do. And I, I appreciate it. I've had the opportunity to be able to um, see some of your, um, you've shared with me previously some images and pictures of uh, the research you've done in the past. And um, it's quite interesting to take a look at these creatures that are not the warm and fuzzy ones, but are equally as important to our to the ecology of the area. So um, I wanna invite our guests to come back again and join us on March 12th for a conversation about songbirds with, with naturalist Scott Bills. You can sign up on our website. And thank you again, Dr. Mashaka for joining us today. Again, if, if anybody still has a question, please send it to our email and we will do our best to reply. Thank you, Walter and Beth, for a great program. As a reminder, next week we'll be, we will send this recording. Now we do have the holiday on Monday, so it might be more like Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, but check your email for the ones that uh, you provided when you registered, and uh, we'll add that social media platform. Uh, if you're interested in donating to support these programs, I included a link in that chat box to the Pennsylvania Heritage Foundation. 
Uh, don't forget to sign up for next week's program with the State Museum's Program Director Bradley Smith for a Spirited Republic whis Whiskey Distilling in Pennsylvania. Sign up for any of the Learn at Lunchtime programs. Here's the next uh, several ones that are coming up. Uh, use that uh, link in the chat box or here's the website here. Uh, once again, thank you for attending and have a great weekend.